want you to hit me as hard as you can. Hello. My name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. What makes a classic? How do you somehow create a perfect film? Is it luck, talent, or just meant to be? When people think about perfect movies, there aren't that many usually that can be thought of, but typically, one that will be on that list is The Princess Bride. Released in 1987, The Princess Bride did okay business, but over time, viewers, fans, and history have come to show us that it's a rare film that is almost magically perfect. That would be inconceivable. And all of those facts mean it's perfect for us. On this episode of Fantasizing About Fantasy Films, we're going to journey into the storybook story of the inconceivably wonderful The Princess Bride. As you wish. The Princess Bride was a passion project of director Rob Reiner from the time he was given the book to read by his father, Carl, who was given the book by the author, William Goldman. It would seem that The Princess Bride was always destined to have family links, as it was inspired by Goldman's own daughters back in 1973. He told them when they were around the ages of seven and four, I'll write you a story. What do you want it to be about? One said, a princess. The other said, a bride. And Goldman told them, then that's the title. Carrie always would be gifted the book from his stepfather when he was 13 years old, and he would always identify with Wesley. Goldman was a prolific screenwriter whose work won and was nominated for multiple Academy Awards. Most notably was Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid in 1969, The Stepford Wives, All the President's Men, Magic, Misery, and that's just some of them. Goldman wasn't stuck in any one genre, but seemed a master of them all. He notably loved working in the realms of Stephen King, writing four screenplays based on his work. This will be important later. Trust me. So what happens now? We face each other as God intended. Sportsman life. This may be why The Princess Bride worked on so many levels with not only being a fantasy epic, but a comedy, a love story, a revenge tale, with a few others mixed in. The original book had a sort of viral marketing within it, and the publishers played along. In the original novel, Goldman himself is a semi-fictional character of the bookend story within the book. Goldman discovers the novel The Princess Bride by S. Morgenstern, and what you, the reader, are reading is his adaptation of the original. The story still follows Buttercup and Wesley, with more in-depth information about Gilder and Florin, including a map of the kingdoms. Goldman includes information about a missing scene his publisher wouldn't allow him to include due to quote-unquote legal issues, but states that you can write the publisher for a copy. This actually happened and continued for some time, with readers submitting requests for a copy of the scene, and instead they'd receive a letter with information about all the legal issues of why the scene could not be published or sent out due to the Morgan Stern estate. In later editions of the book, it was stated you could read the scene online, but the website would only take you to copies of the legal issue letter, which had been updated over the years, which is just evilly brilliant. Try ruling the world sometime. There were a number of attempts at adapting the book to film, including one by Ray Harryhausen, but no one could seem to capture it or make it work. At one point, Goldman had been paid half a million dollars for the rights back in the early 70s, but eventually he bought the rights back, not trusting anyone it would seem to bring the story to the screen. But that's when Rob Reiner showed up after having turned it up to 11. What we do is if we need that extra push over the cliff, you know what we do? Uh, put it up to 11. 11, exactly. Reiner had come off of directing his first film, This Is Spinal Tap, in 1984, having also written the comedy, which would co-star Christopher Guest. The film was a hit, and he'd follow it up with The Sure Thane, which was also a hit, making four times its budget back on release. When Stand By Me came out in 1986, it was clear Reiner knew how to make a movie. While most viewers would know him as Archie Bunker's hapless son-in-law Michael, aka Meathead, from All in the Family, Reiner had found another calling behind the camera. And it would be thanks to All in the Family and the creator of that groundbreaking series, Norman Lear, who would help finance Reiner's choice of follow-up film. The stars had aligned and William Goldman came on board to write the screenplay for Reiner and the magic that would be The Princess Bride began. Let me take this opportunity to thank you all for watching Fantasizing About Fantasy Films and ask that if you enjoyed our shows, please subscribe to our channel right now. Like this video and click on the bell so you can be notified each time a new video goes up. Now, 
back to the show. Bye bye, boys. Have fun storming the castle. When it came to the cast, The Princess Bride would be inconceivably perfect. Rob Reiner had seen actor Carrie Elwes in the film Lady Jane and saw within the young actor the Douglas Fairbanks swashbuckler who would make a perfect Dread Pirate Robert slash Dashing Wesley. And he lived up to the ideal. Elwes sustained an injury just starting into filming that broke his toe, so most of the shoot he was walking around while still having a broken bone. He did many of his own stunts as well, even coming up with the idea of diving face first into the quicksand to save Buttercup. Originally, the scene was to be shot with him going in feet first, but Elwes thought the dive was far more heroic. It was a risky move as he could have broken his neck if something went wrong with the trap door mechanism at the bottom of the quicksand and it didn't open. But after a stunt performer tried it, Elwes did it himself. Elwes wound up actually in an ER due to one injury that was filmed and used in the movie. The scene where Count Rugen knocks out Wesley, Christopher Guest actually knocked Elwes unconscious. Guest had been having trouble making the hit look authentic and so Elwes said just for him to go for it. You have six fingers on your right hand. Someone was looking for you. He in fact did. Maybe it's the extra finger strength. Reiner used the shot that Elwes actually went limp do to be knocked out for real. And I mean, it was the most authentic. It's conceivable, you miserable, vomitous mess. This performing of his own stunts and swordplay would carry over massively to his duel with Mandy Patinkin. The epic sword fight between Inigo and Wesley would take months of training, with Patinkin stating he spent two months prior training, and then for four months further, he and Elways would spend any day they weren't shooting, training. Who are you? No one of consequence. I must get used to disappointment. They were trained by the legendary Bob Anderson, who worked on numerous films over the years, including Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi, where he was the stunt double for Darth Vader during the lightsaber fights. Anderson had the two actors not only learn their own fight moves, but each other's fight moves. On top of that, they learned how to sword fight both right and left handed. Other than one backflip, the entire fight sequence is Patinkin and Elwes. You seem a decent fellow. I hate to kill you. You seem a decent fellow. I hate to die. It's now known that the story of Patinkin taking the role of Inigo Montoya was inspired by the loss of his father. If you watch the documentary about the film, I dare you not to be moved by Patinkin's story as he relates it. I'd lost my father in 1972. It just hit a chord with me that I want my father back just like he does. His father passed away in 1972 from cancer at the very young age of 53. During filming, Patinkin would have conversations with the spirit of his father. And I remember we were outside that castle and I took a walk in this beautiful moat. And I just kept talking to my dad, saying, I'm going to write it. I'm going to write this wrong. And when the time came for the fight between Inigo and Count Rugen, when he says the line, I want my father back, you son of a bitch. He's speaking to the cancer. I killed the cancer that killed my father. And for a moment, he was alive. And if you notice, or perhaps it's just me, Mandy's accent slips away and the words are in his own voice. The look on his face and the power of the delivery is amazing. Robin Wright's casting as Buttercup was one of the last to be cast. There were numerous actresses who tried out for the part, but none really clicked. Wright seemed to fit the bill perfectly. She beat out actresses like Uma Thurman, Courtney Cox, and Sean Young for the role. In fact, there were around 500 actresses that were seen. Wright and Elwes had some fantastic chemistry as the leads, and this was no doubt helped by the fact they were both crushing it on each other pretty hard during filming. Elwes described Wright as looking like a young Grace Kelly, and it made it distracting. He was so taken with her. But that was sort of the plot, so... There's a shortage of perfect breasts in this world. It would be a pity to damage yours. Andre the Giant was born to be Fezzik. Even though at first he wouldn't even read for the role, he was always Goldman's first choice to play the part. By the time filming started though, Andre had had back surgery and couldn't physically do the feats of strength that Fezzik was known for. Even Carrie and Buttercup required special rigging and trickery, but Andre was perfect for the gentle giant. During filming, the cast became quite like a family, and Andre's favorite part of filming was that no one looked at him. He didn't stand out. There were no odd stares. He simply was Andre. Everyone who worked with him had a story about him and not an unkind word. Everyone loved him. One story though is just how much Andre could put away when it came time to let loose. 
When everyone would go to dinner, Andre would order four appetizers and five entrees. While eating, he'd drink a 40 ounce pitcher of a drink he called the American, which was 40 different liquors mixed together. Carrie Elby said, I've never tasted airplane fuel, but I imagine it's very close to what that must taste like. I'm sorry, Nigo. I didn't mean to jar him so hard. Wallace Shawn, who played Bazzini, the most verbose man in all the kingdom, wasn't actually the first choice for their role. Originally, Reiner had wanted Danny DeVito for the part. When Shawn found out about this, it made him a nervous wreck for the entire shoot. I can't compete with you physically, and you're no match for my brains. Honestly, though, I don't think anyone could think of Bazzini and not see Wallace Shawn. He made the part his own. Inconceivable! You keep using the horde. I don't know think it means what you think it means. But no story is complete without its villains, and boy does the Princess Bride deliver on that score. Chris Sarandon is perfect as the handsome yet true bastard Humperdinck, the man that can apparently smell the odorless poison Iocane. Iocane. I bet my life on it. This is one of the most awesome callbacks to a line ever, by the way. And Christopher Guest shows the true power of his ability to be a chameleon as Count Rugen, the six-fingered man who gets his just rewards from the little boy who he left scarred and fatherless. My name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. Stop saying that! But we can't forget our bookend story of the little boy home with the flu and his grandfather who manages to convince his grandson to like a kissing book. Fred Savage and Peter Falk were adorable in these scenes, and the film wouldn't be the same without that perfect setup and Falk's delivery. Maybe you could come over and read it again to me tomorrow. As you wish. The entire film was shot in England, including the bedroom scenes with Savage and Falk in 1986. The film's soundtrack was actually composed by Mark Knopfler, with the song Storybook Love being nominated for the Best Original Song at the Academy Awards in 1988. Reiner was a fan of Knopfler's work with Dire Straits, and Knopfler was a fan of Spinal Tap. The Princess Bride wasn't a massive hit on release. It made around double its $16 million budget back, so it was a sedate beginning. Over the years, of course, The Princess Bride has become a modern classic with a following that grows with every viewing and began, as most things did in the 80s, with releases on home video and cable. When it came to merchandising, it's interesting to see that there are more items being created now than when the movie was originally released, with various board games, card games, t-shirts, and collectibles. In 2008, there was a Princess Bride video game released with Mandy Patinkin, Wallace Shawn, and Robin Wright voicing their characters. In late September of this year, McFarlane Toys announced a line of Princess Bride action figures. There's a Monopoly Princess Bride edition game, a line of Funko Pops, and a never-ending series of t-shirts and fan art you can buy online. In the 25th anniversary edition of the novel, there was mention of a sequel, Buttercup's Baby. This continued in other editions with a chapter that had a collection of snippets of parts of a story which tells us that Buttercup and Wesley named their daughter Waverly. This also continues Goldman's wraparound story and talks about his anger at the Morgenstern family, giving the green light to write the sequel, not to him, but to Stephen King. I told you his name would come up again. Hello. Goldman sadly passed away in 2018 before he could complete the sequel, having stated previously he was having trouble with the story. There has been talk of a Princess Bride musical for the past 15 years, starting while Goldman was alive in 2006, with that attempt falling to the wayside. Since then, there was talk of Disney doing a musical version, but that has since stalled as well. In 2020, during the pandemic, a hilarious fan-made recreation of The Princess Bride was made for the now-dead service Quibi, called Home Movie The Princess Bride. Many of the original cast was involved and everyone gave their blessings for use of music in the script, with various celebrities recreating parts of scenes. Rob Reiner and his father Carl also were in the production, with this being the last appearance of Carl Reiner on screen. The project was dedicated to his memory with it raising money for the World Central Kitchen. You can find the entire production on YouTube. Most of the cast returned for a table read of the script, with other celebrities joining along for a Princess Bride reunion to support the Democratic Party of Wisconsin during a live stream pay-per-view event. In 2019, there was talk of a remake, and immediately it seemed everyone screamed back at that thought, inconceivable. 
Carrie Elwes' quote summed it up best on social media. There's a shortage of perfect movies in this world. It would be a pity to damage this one. And that line truly encapsulates how I feel, and many others do too, about The Princess Bride. The film is actually perfect. There's something timeless here and special. It's one of those movies that found the balance between the fairy tale for children and bringing in just enough adult feeling and story too. It's sarcastic, witty, beautiful, and eternally quotable. It doesn't pander. It has revenge, romance, love, and loyalty. There's something simple about it, but at the same time, there's levels there. The best example is Inigo and his quest for revenge, and how he just keeps repeating the words he always wanted to say to the man who killed his father. He'd prepared nothing else, hasn't thought ahead past this moment. At the end of the movie, he even admits to Wesley he doesn't know what else he's going to do with his life because revenge has been the driving force for so long. It's very strange. I have been in the revenge business so long. Now that it's over, I don't know what to do with the rest of my life. Have you ever considered Paris? You'd make a wonderful trip, Pirate Roberts. Piracy, though, seems to be the next step, but that's some pretty great writing when you look a little deeper. The Princess Bride is not only perfect, it's timeless, just as the years have shown us. It keeps touching the lives of fans and newcomers with not only the story within the film, but the stories outside of it. Such was the recent TikTok video of the young woman who was connected to Mandy Patinkin by his son after she posted the heartbreaking video of herself speaking about the loss of her father and how the rumor of Patinkin using the loss of his dad fueled his role. Of course, it wasn't a rumor. It was what motivated the performance and the reaction of the actor seeing the video is powerful to watch. You can talk to your dad anytime you want, anywhere you want. And, um, I'm, yeah. and I'm just glad you and he shared that movie. That's the sort of magic that a perfect film can create. They are very rare, you know, and when you find one, you want to keep it forever. And The Princess Bride doesn't appear to be going anywhere and keeps growing more and more each year. All I can say to that is, as you wish, Princess Bride, as you wish. <laughs>